applications and look forward to getting to know you over the course of the next uh, few weeks together. I'm joined by my colleagues from the U.S. Embassy in Islamabad. I myself sit at the U.S. Department of State in Washington, D.C., and serve as a special advisor to the Assistant Secretary for South and Central Asian Affairs and as Executive Director of the U.S. Pakistan Women's Council. Um, I think most of you heard from my colleague, Jocelyn Steiner, um, during the webinar, a few, it was it two weeks ago, regarding um, the council, but I just wanted to situate um, this initiative a little bit. So the U.S.-Pakistan Women's Council is a really um, exciting public-private partnership that the State Department launched in 2012, and it brings together academia, government, both the government of Pakistan and the government of the United States, as well as um, the private sector to create initiatives that can reach women in Pakistan, women and girls in Pakistan. We work on women's entrepreneurship, access to employment, and access to education. And we've reached and worked with and, um, hundreds and thousands of women across Pakistan over the past um, 10 plus years. This accelerator is one of our um, key initiatives this year. And so we're really thrilled to be able to um, dive deep into this topic of entrepreneurship. And Amina, um, thank you so much for joining us today and being our distinguished speaker, kicking off this exciting initiative. Um, before I turn it to Amina, I wanted to briefly welcome Elizabeth Horst, who is our Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary and Deputy Assistant Secretary for Pakistan within the Bureau of South and Central Asian Affairs um, to welcome us and um, describe a little bit more about um, the Council. Good morning, good evening, and assalamu alaikum. It's a great honor for me to be here with you all today to launch the first U.S.-Pakistan Women's Council, Pak Launch Women's Business Accelerator. I would like to begin by thanking Pak Launch, especially Ali Fad, for his partnership and hard work to bring leading investors in the United States and Pakistan together to strengthen the entrepreneurial ecosystem in Pakistan. The United States and Pakistan have maintained close ties for 75 years, working jointly to promote the mutual prosperity of our people. Our work to support women's economic advancement is a critical focus of a broad-based relationship with Pakistan. I wanted to take a moment to highlight a few notable examples of our cooperation in the past three months alone. In January, the United States pledged $100 million first minister-level Trade and Investment Framework Agreement Council meeting in seven years took place in February. Notably, the U.S. and Pakistan announced a joint statement during that TIFA Council committing to work together to support women's entrepreneurship, women-owned businesses participation in global supply chains, and women's mentorship as part of this effort. A few weeks ago, Pakistan hosted the U.S.-Pakistan Energy Security Dialogue to advance Pakistan's transition to renewable energy and promote a more secure and prosperous energy future for both of our countries. I was thrilled to join Assistant Secretary Jeff Pyatt in launching the second cohort of the U.S.-Pakistan Women's Council's Future of Women in Energy Scholars Program during the dialogue. The initiative will connect undergraduate Pakistani female scientists with an opportunity to study and explore career opportunities in the energy economy through the Texas A&M University in Qatar. And the list continues. In short, we recognize the vast potential in the U.S.-Pakistan relationship and are committed to build and deepen our cooperation to support the mutual prosperity of both our countries. From our perspective, there are many emerging opportunities for U.S. investment in Pakistan, especially for the country's growing digital economy, given Pakistan's English-speaking, young, tech-savvy, and entrepreneurial population, including and especially Pakistan's women entrepreneurs. Succeeding may not come easy, and we recognize there are many challenges, but progress is within reach. Last month, more than 140 women entrepreneurs from Pakistan and 42 corporations joined the first U.S.-Pakistan Think Big Summit to increase Pakistani women-owned businesses' participation in local, regional, and global value chains. Our takeaway? Companies want to source from women-owned businesses in Pakistan. Yet, as in so many countries around the world, business scale, access to networks, information and finance remain barriers that hold women back from achieving their potential to contribute to Pakistan's economy. 
Today's effort is one of the United States' myriad initiatives to address these gaps. We know gender parity in the economy could unlock 30% growth in Pakistan's GDP and are committed to bringing together the force of government, the private sector, women entrepreneurs, and civil society as partners to unleash this growth. By connecting women entrepreneurs with networks, capacity building, mentors in the United States and Pakistan, and opportunities to compete for capital, the accelerator aims to support women entrepreneurs' capacity to scale, create jobs, and invest in Pakistan's economy. More broadly, the initiative highlights what's possible when the people of our two countries come together. Through this unique four and a half month program, you will hear perspectives from leading investors and business leaders across both our countries regarding how to build a business plan, form a team to optimize business performance, tips for how to develop your personal brand, and much more. Through the Accelerator's office hours, you'll get feedback from highly experienced mentors on every aspect of business development. Through funding from the State Department's Power Initiative, U.S. Embassy Islamabad will support U.S. women investors to travel to Pakistan. The best and brightest of women entrepreneurs participating in this cohort will have the opportunity to pitch their business ideas, gaining practical insights regarding how to attract venture funding to help business scale growth. And most importantly, you will gain access to a network and community of women-owned businesses that can prove invaluable guidance, support, and advice. I hope you can draw from this program what you need to succeed. Thank you and best wishes. America, Pakistan, Zindabad. Thank you so much to Elizabeth and to those who've just joined us, um, welcome. Just a quick housekeeping note before I introduce our distinguished speaker today, Amina Hassan, if we could kindly ask everyone to rename themselves. Um, as Elizabeth mentioned, we'll be doing a number of exciting um, activities together over the next few weeks, um, including uh, pitch competition and office hours, but require attendance in at least um, five out of the six um, webinars. And for that, we do require attendance be taken. We can't do that um, if we don't have your names. Um, so you might see a note pop up from me if um, we aren't able to read your names. Also, I just want to make sure everyone feels comfortable with the technology. Um, if, if you're not able, I presume that everyone has fluency in Zoom, but we don't want to be um, presumptuous. If there's anyone who has any challenges, um, please do let Ali or I know. Um, I'll drop my email in the chat. Um, you can feel free to email us if you're not familiar with the functions, um, chat functions and the like. So with that and no further ado, I'd like to introduce Amina Hassan. Um, Amina, thank you so much for joining us. She is currently the head of strategy and finance at Abi. Abi's last funding round was at a valuation of $90 million that they raised to build financial freedom platforms to change the way one receives and spends their salary. She's a strategic advisor to CARE that aims to digitize healthcare for women from awareness to access. She's also a financial advisor to Raft Properties certainly wears many hats. Amina was previously an associate at PJT Partners, a premier global advisory focused investment bank that delivers a wide array of strategic advisory, shareholder advisory, restructuring and special situation and private fund advisory, and fundraising services to corporations, financial sponsors, institutional investors, alternative alternative investment managers and governments around the world. Amina has a bachelor's degree in economics from Dartmouth College, and we couldn't have found a better person to speak to us this morning um, on, on this, these critical topics. Over to you, Amina. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Radhika, for the introduction and uh, for your team and, and Ali's work in putting together these sessions. Um, I'm honored to be the first speaker of this uh, series. And um, I look forward to continuing the dialogue after that as well. So personally, this is important to me because I um, I'm one of the people who was inspired by the work that Park Launch and others did to uh, kind of start the, the uh, to bring the Pakistan startup ecosystem off the ground, and uh, decided to leave my job in in the Bay Area to to come back and be part of the ecosystem here. So I think one of the things that I focus on during during my uh, job at, at Abi Finance 
is really around fundraising and financing. Um, financing, I think, is one thing that um, even if you're not a, a technical finance person, I think as a founder, it's something that, you know, is really important to learn about as you have conversations with different investors, um, as you're thinking about how you want to grow your business and kind of the different options available to you. So um, I'll start off with talking a little bit about kind of internally what uh, some of the key things to keep in mind are, and then we'll kind of move forward and talk um, about some of the um, external facing things that um, are important to think about as well. Can everyone see my screen okay? Yes. Sir. Great. Okay, so to start off, um, I just wanted to think about some of the key kind of financial considerations that founders um, should think about. So I think firstly um, around, you know, equity split. So often as co-founders, you will be faced with uh, deciding what kind of equity you want to have. Um, you know, you'll have to maybe recruit a co-founder shortly after deciding on what kind of company you want to form. And, um, you know, there's many different kinds of advice uh, that you could kind of follow on this. I think in general, the key idea here is a, you know, whose idea was it initially? Um, the, the person whose idea was it, um, you know, has, has an important contribution to the company. And I think the roles and responsibilities of each founder is also really important uh, to really think about their time commitment, their responsibilities, um, I think thirdly, another thing to think about is the opportunity cost, if how much each of the co-founders would earn if they were to find a job in the market. And then fourth, kind of the stage of the company, um, if it's earlier, then it's it's more riskier. So someone who's coming in at that stage potentially would want um, a kind of higher amount of equity. And then I think something that Y Combinator, which is one of the premier um, kind of startup accelerators advocates for, is a 50-50 split to kind of promote equity, uh, equality, and uh, fairness. Um, but I think in practical time, you'll realize that for, um, you know, if you're the CEO, you might want to have majority control. So you have greater than 50% equity so that there's no issues with who makes the decisions. Um, if you're taking a full-time role as a founding member, you would want to have, um, you know, greater than... 25% of equity early on. And then I think you should also be prepared on the fact that you may have, you know, founders leave um, and, you know, they may have vesting schedules on their equity as well. So it's important to have some kind of a um, founding agreement as well between the co-founders uh, before you start, you know, hiring people or, or kind of considering having a co-founder. Moving on, I think for, for non-co-founders, you'll realize that you know early on, especially when you're hiring pre-seed level, you'll need to have shares uh, that you can give to your employees to incentivize them to perform. Uh, most venture capital investors will ask you to establish a employee options pool or an ESOP and, and kind of increase that over time. Typically in a series A uh, kind of raise, you would be asked to put around 10% of the equity into the employee, employee options pool. And then that may go up to you know, 15 to 20% depending on the, the stage of the company. Um, so in terms of uh, the, the things that you see on the screen, these are some kind of general guidelines which, which I, I, I was you know, looking for and, and found. I think in Pakistan, um, the senior hires would be considered kind of people in the kind of um, C-suite range. So CFO, CTO, COO, uh, who have kind of uh, pretty high salaries compared to local markets. Um, engineers similarly would have Kind of similar equity uh, requirements if they are senior and have kind of worked with other startups and service providers as well. You know, if you may potentially have issues with cash payments to lawyers and you know other advisors, you can also give them some equity um, as as a kind of way of of compensating them. And similarly with other advisors, so sometimes people who are maybe helping you make introductions to clients and things like that. They could also be people who you know you could potentially give an inequity um, stake to. 
The other thing is that um, it really depends on the vesting schedule for your equity, because usually with startups, the vest vesting for equity is around four years, with 25% uh, of the shares vesting equally per year. Um, but obviously, this depends on you know the type of business you have and the stage that you're at currently. Um, <clears throat> one thing I would think about when you're looking to raise funding is that you know there is going to be a dilutive impact on you as a founder um, as early as possible. So from the time that you're on kind of this stage right now, which is the pre-seed incubator stage to the series uh, A, B, C stage, you know, your, your, your uh, percentage of equity will go down significantly, but that's really what also allows you to raise more money. Um, so you'll maybe at the end of your series C level, you're at around 30% equity, and the value of your stake can can go down over over time. So one thing that we always recommend uh, to other companies and something that we also do regularly at Abi is to kind of look at our um, our pro forma cap table, which is our capitalization table around uh, which kind of states how um, shares have been split between founders, investors, and the employee pool, and looking at kind of where we want to go in the future what kind of um, dilution level we're comfortable with. So at the end of each stage, you should typically assume that, you know, you'll have around three to five investment rounds before, before a successful exit. Um, at each round, a new, a new investor will ask for around a 10 to 15% uh, of equity and kind of ask you to, uh, you know, top up the, the ESOP pool as well. So um, you should typically be prepared for that dilution. And I think one thing that's that's different if you're a first time founder is that, you know, the dilution in your equity should not be something to be scared about. It really is a mechanism of growth and, and in, long, in the long term, you know, will have a lot of reward as your valuation continues to increase. So as you can see here in the graph, um, the founder's equity at the pre-seed level was around $900,000. And then at the Series C level, it was around 87 million. So that's something that, you know, everyone should be aware of and, you know, continue to, to kind of learn more about. Another thing I think, uh, you know, wh while it's important to think about valuation and, you know, your stock uh, kind of how you want to split up equity, et cetera. I think what's really, really important, especially in the first year, is to have a realistic budget. Um, and, and it's really important to basically have the confidence in yourself to be able to kind of have some kind of, um, you know, um, you need some kind of flexibility to be able to fund some of the startup yourself at the beginning as you look to raise funds. So at the first, at the very, very beginning, you'll have expenses like company registration, you know, uh, negotiations, you might need some legal uh, advice for which you may need to give some payments for. Uh, you'll also need to put together a business plan and financial model, etc. cetera. Um, so these are something that I think, you know, you should really be prepared for and have a very detailed budget for so that you know that even if it takes you, you know, longer than a year or so to raise the funds that you're looking for, you have, you know, you're also looking at alternative funding at the same time as venture capital investment because you you do need to survive and you know continue to have some traction. So um, this is kind of gives you a brief kind of overview of how you can think about which areas of which you should focus on and, and spend money on in your first year of operations. If we go to the next slide, um, it shows you kind of more detailed uh, vision of what exactly you'll be spending. So obviously this is all in dollars. In, in our case, you know, yours will be in rupees, but, but uh, you know, you may also have some expenses in dollars if you are looking to incorporate, um, you know, uh, um, overseas entities as well. So I think having a very, very keen uh, kind of uh, focus on your budget and particularly focus on profitability early on, I think really sets you up for success in this kind of current market where there's a global recession and a lot of macroeconomic issues within the Pakistan ecosystem, it is very difficult to raise venture capital investment. And so any other sort, sorts of uh, funding you can get is, is most helpful, but also being able to kind of bootstrap your business, as they say, or really being able to manage your expenses with, with your revenue is really, really important for all Pakistani uh, startups that are looking to kind of raise money at this point in time. So um, I think that this is kind of 
something that everyone should think about. And obviously there are ways in which you can save money. For example, with some of your first employees or contractors, you could always hire people part-time, you know, on, on websites like Upwork and Fiverr, you know, marketing promotion, you could always pay marketing in, in equity. Uh, travel can be limited, uh, but, you know, it should be important as well. Um, and financial consultants, you know, you could maybe have one in-house person rather than having a proper uh, kind of investment bank to help you. So um, and another thing is that as a founder, you know, your living expenses and your salary is also important. I think a lot of founders think that they shouldn't take any money at the start. But I think that uh, realistically, you know, having a decent salary that's not, you know, super ambitious, but something that kind of allows you to maintain your household expenses is, is really important to for your own mental health and for the longevity of the business and the, you know, impact that you'll have on it. The other things that I would think about is really as soon as possible, um, you would you want to start developing a three-year financial model to kind of plot out your future milestones in terms of basically uh, a kind of when you can have your hiring needs met, your key metrics, so other than just your revenue, but kind of your users, uh, kind of which new business areas you can go to depending on any regulatory constraints, um, your your cash burn, how much cash you have to uh, pay to keep your business alive and how much funding you'll have to raise before you become profitable. And then having kind of like different scenarios based on your traction, based on the environment is also really, really helpful in terms of adapting your business to uh, and, and your strategy to kind of the current economic environment. I think uh, one thing that comes that's, that's really people think that often financial modeling is something that is left to the consultants and, you know, the specific finance person. But I think that this, the founders are fundamentally tied to that, not only because they have the highest, uh, you know, amount of equity, uh, but also because it's really important for the founders to be aware of the budget and to be spending, uh, you know, in control of what investors would, would think is prudent and responsible, because at the end of the day, it's the founder's reputation that on which the investors are giving you funding. So this is just a graph that shows you kind of, you know, the future returns that um, different uh, startup founders had at the time of exit. So as you can see, a lot of them didn't have very high levels of equity, uh, but given the valuation, they were you know, able to cash out a significant amount of money. And that's something that is worth using to motivate yourself. So looking at the percentage of equity you have um, at exit, what you think that will be, what you, what you want your target valuation to be, um, and then kind of using that figure to motivate you in terms of looking at your potential gains from the startup versus you know, the opportunity cost of having a nine to five corporate job. It's really important to you know only go into being a founder if you really feel that this is really the best kind of um, financial and overall uh, you know business decision for you as an individual. Um, so basically, in conclusion, it's really important to kind of have all of these things on track, both your internal functions, your own equity position, as well as kind of your budget and you know uh, your financial modeling. Part of what goes into your financial modeling is really looking at all of your key metrics. So obviously, you know, revenue is something that you we continuously discussed. And I think a lot of founders sometimes think that this is the most important metric. I think revenue is just kind of the, the start of the income statement. It just gives you an idea of your sales. But what in, in my mind is actually more important is looking at kind of the overall profitability and your expenses, because you really need to be able to operate a sustainable business model. Um, so having a firm grasp on these fundamentals is really vital. The other thing is that as you kind of, uh, we'll, we'll go through the financial statements in, in some detail in just a bit, but um, another thing that's really important is your burn rate. So looking at how much cash you have at the beginning of the month and the end of the month um, and looking at uh, kind of, you know, how much you've burned over that particular month or even your um, is really important because investors need to know that you're even if you're not profitable, you are using their money responsibly, and they'll use measures like the runway to look at kind of how often, uh, how long you'll be in business for at the current amount of cash you're burning. So that's just something that I think you know we can I can definitely kind of offer more resources to to explain more details about these metrics, but just want to go through them at a high level. 
um, it's something that investors really, really do uh, pay attention to. And I think as a founder, the quicker you're able to be a profitable company, uh, you know, the more comfort it'll give to investors, especially investors who are open to, you know, um, investing in a market like Pakistan, which is not really, um, you know, uh, at a good economic situation right now. If you're a profitable company, it'll definitely help you, you know, get access to more funding and also, you know, make investors more likely to give you money for, for example, opening new markets in addition to being present in, in Pakistan. So in, in Abhi's case, in the company that I work for, this was something that really helped us is that, you know, within a year of operating, we were able to be profitable. And hence now we are, are able to comfortably open um, operations in Bangladesh and the UAE, as well as, you know, in other, other markets as well. So uh, that's something that I would really, really emphasize. Um, the other thing that I would think about is how you're acquiring customers. So your lifetime value uh, of a customer, basically how much uh, they're they're purchasing and how often they purchase is really important to uh, see how much revenue you expect from one particular customer. If, if you're a SaaS model, obviously you have a little bit more clarity on you know, your subscriptions volumes, but in general, it's really important to know that that customer isn't just someone who's going to be on your platform for a month or so and then kind of go away and you, know, um, you have a high rate of churn. It's, it's really important to pay attention to not only acquiring new customers, but also retaining them and also the cost of retaining them. So for example, the uh, customer acquisition cost is something that investors also really care about a lot. So, so how much you're spending on sales, marketing, all the other kind of distribution channels you have to get new customers so that your customer acquisition costs are kind of um, one third of the lifetime value of the customer. That's like a general rule of thumb that investors kind of expect you to have. The other thing is that um, when you're looking into new projects and new business areas, it's really important to look at the ROI. So the value that you're getting of the project relative to the cost, um, you know, it's it can be really exciting um, to do new partnerships and, you know, find new sources of revenues. But you need to really look at how you're splitting revenue with whatever partners you're planning to work with, um, you know, and, and the cost of operating um, that particular project, whether it's marketing costs, whether it's, you know, um, other other costs that are necessary. So these are something that I think these are all kind of the most top of mind for investors and, you know, should be top of mind for the, the co-founders at, at all times. <clears throat> the other thing that I think this all kind of leads to is, is, you know, as I said, that there is a lot of um, uncertainty around the macro environment and access to capital is becoming increasingly more limited. Um, I think it's important to have a broad array of funding options from the start. Um, venture capital equity investment is obviously an ideal uh, investor group, but there are a lot of different opportunities, you know, obviously some that are, you know, facilitated by organizations like Park Launch and, you know, by the, the U.S. government agencies who do provide things like grants and, you know, incubators as well as accelerators. Um, I think it's really important to tap into as many of these uh, kind of equity free investment options as you can. Um, also, crowdfunding is, is really important. And um, even, you know, uh, talking to existing, um, you know, investors that are in your space. So, for example, maybe, you know, if you're in uh, your, for, for example, trying to disrupt something in the textile industry, talking to existing textile companies in Pakistan who are looking to maybe have uh, make an investment in a high growth, um, high margin business could be a really, really good strategic fit. Um, similarly, if you're in the um, something like the, um, you know, cosmetics industry, you could also talk to existing players there or other kind of FMCG companies. So I would really uh, not forget about traditional, the tra traditional sector as well and see what kind of investments they're able to make. Similarly, obviously friends and family, you know, you can always talk about the investment returns and see what kind of commitments they can make. Microfinances and banks are all also, um, you know, an important part. I think that with banks, obviously, uh, there is an interest rate associated with repaying a loan. So you have to really make sure that those things are working for you. Um, and I think other things like pitch competitions or crowdfunding can also be really important. So definitely have a very, very broad approach to how you're thinking about funding. Don't just talk to VCs um, who 
uh, I have invested in Pakistan before, I think talk to a wide array, array of groups, angel investors. There's a lot of angel investors in the US or, or those who are from Pakistan originally, but now are all over the world um, who, who really do wanna help the ecosystem. So that's something to keep in mind um, as you kind of go along this. And then the other thing that is really uh, kind of a new form of financing is revenue-based financing and invoice-based financing. There's something that Abi, my company personally does is uh, kind of look at invoice-based lending for companies which have healthy uh, cash positions. Um, and revenue-based financing can often be, you know, if you're kind of an e-commerce business and you're operating through a payments platform or a kind of facilitator like Shopify or Stripe or something like that, you can often tap into these funding sources as well. So obviously keep a broad view of, of all the funding options. Um, some of the more complex ones, uh, I think, won't be relevant at this stage, but for when you're kind of at a, at a late, later stage, things like venture debt and, and commercial paper, et cetera, also become important. So it's worth keeping all those things in mind. But I think one thing that's really important with all this is to really have a very comprehensive financial model, looking at your cash position, your profit and loss, your planning for revenue, hiring, et cetera. So that even when you're explaining to uh, business uh, potential investors who may be not so familiar with how startup investing comes, you have very strong uh, financials to back up your claims. Um, so I would really, really highly encourage you to develop this internally as soon as possible. Um, obviously, if you're not a finance person, take help from you know people who do this professionally, but as as the CEO, definitely also have an important kind of hands-on approach to your financial plan and budget and your path to profitability. Um, the other thing that's also really important is that raising funds takes a long time. Often it can take from 18 to 24 months to close your round. So as you do this, it's really, really important to track all the conversations you've had what the status is, and also regularly send monthly updates to investors and potential investors who you're talking to, to be continuously pop top of mind with them, create stronger relationships and assure them of your company's health and your personal presence. Because I think when people go silent, that's when investors kind of start to feel like, oh, I haven't heard from, from them in a while. I wonder what's up. If you kind of start this practice of sending regularly monthly updates to them, or even people who are interested in your business, they don't just have to be your investors. It really sends a, so a strong signal and kind of also allows them to kind of ask more specific questions. So one thing that I, I uh, that we do as a company, I think a lot of companies will, will do is to ha have this kind of a monthly email, which kind of tells you about some of the key financials, KPIs, customer updates, kind of any team changes, any asks they want from investors, any kind of good or bad news. And then also attach, we'll also usually attach the Excel uh, kind of financials as well. So key KPIs plus kind of key financial indicators that they report on a monthly basis to investors. So this is something that I think is really, really important. There's a lot of really, really great resources online that can help you with this as well. If you, you know, need some specific guidance, I'm, I'm happy to point you in the right direction uh, with that as well. So um, just to kind of move on, now we'll go a little bit more in depth into what exactly the financial planning steps are and how you can build out your financial model. So firstly, I think you, uh, you know, it's important to first project out what your revenue looks like, what your pricing is, what your sales cycle is, what acquisition, uh, kind of customer acquisition and retention looks like, and kind of building out your revenue based on kind of the exact number of, um, you know, products you're selling a month. So a bottoms up approach. This allows you to really be able to forecast in a much more um, accurate way than just going off kind of the addressable market and kind of taking a percentage of that, which can often kind of lead you to maybe overestimate some of your forecasts in some cases. Um, on the cost side, you look at kind of the cost of goods sold, so your variable costs, your fixed costs. Um, it's important to kind of segment these out and, and report them um, in, in, a, in kind of a detailed way. And then kind of moving on to kind of the cash flow and the assumptions made there and you know met metrics around product customer etc so if you look at this for example income statement or, or profit and loss statement it's it's for a gym uh kind of uh, company which has memberships classes merchandise 
So they are kind of looking at how much they're making their revenue, they're making on each product and giving an overall amount. Then they're looking at their variable costs and adding that here. And then for their fixed costs, you can kind of clearly see what each of the line items are. So salaries, marketing, operations, rent, that allows investors to have a much clearer picture rather than just kind of giving a general overall operating expenses um, number. Um, and I think that one thing that often, if you are outsourcing your financial modeling to a third party, they may not be familiar with what investors are looking for. So it's important to kind of get advice from um, prior co-founders, from investors, and kind of understand what kind of financial metrics they really are interested in seeing and how you can best uh, kind of structure your reporting to uh, be in a format that kind of makes sense for everyone. So in the cash flow statement, this is a pretty standard format for a cash flow statement, kind of goes off of the net income you have from the income statement, and then you make adjustments for non-cash expenses, add in any uses of cash and any additional kind of cash you have from maybe new equity and, and maybe debt raised, uh, raised, and gives you kind of an overall cash balance picture. Uh, similarly, the balance sheet is basically a snapshot of your current assets and liabilities. So kind of what you have on hand, what you kind of own, so to say, and also kind of who you have to pay and your equity. So um, there's a lot of really great resources if you're not familiar with the financial statements, you know, both on YouTube through different uh, things like the Y Combinator Startup School and a lot of other things that are kind of catered to founders. So I would really encourage you to kind of look at, at all possible resources available to get a base understanding of what these things mean yourself um, before, you know, uh, to working with an advisor as well. And I'm happy to kind of uh, provide any specific information that anyone has. Um, and then the other thing is that when you're kind of looking at a pitch book, and I think that you guys are going to have a more detailed session on how, how to kind of put together a pitch deck, it's really important to kind of break down how you're going to spend the money that you're asking for, whether it's, you know, in this case, a lot of their money is going to salaries, marketing, administrative expenses, some capital expenses. Um, at a later stage, maybe your equity will go towards growing new markets, hiring some strategic hires and kind of, you know, uh, launching new products. Um, it's really important for investors to know what exactly they want, uh, what exactly they um, they will be able, to, they will be funding because they often, you know, if you just ask for money without asking for a clear vision of kind of how you're going to use that money, it does kind of create some uncertainty in the minds of investors. So you, you really want to be very prepared for every meeting you have, um, you know, have all the right information and kind of uh, basically be able to answer any questions they have with the materials that are existing. So um, that's kind of the presentation for me, and I'm happy to share it uh, with Ali to pass on to, to the group, but um, please let me know if you have any um, you know, specific questions right now. Thanks so much, Aisha. That was uh, really wonderful. And to the group, um, I just wanna pause by saying I, we have a lot of um, wonderful questions that have come in. Some of this information may um, be, be something that we're very familiar with, um, for others, it might be brand new information, and I would just encourage everyone to um, use the chat function to raise your questions or just take, you know, raise your hand um, so that we can make this information as relevant as possible for you and no question um, is unwarranted. So we welcome all questions. Amina, um, starting with some of our questions from the chat. Um, Dr. Sikandar asks, how can we calculate or evaluate the equity share to the ins institution or also to co-founders if we are part of that institution? And she also wondered if you could share funding or investment opportunities. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think when you're looking at kind of your valuation overall, um, I think a lot of things go into that. C certainly uh, kind of what other uh, companies in the market have been raising at um, in your specific industry at your specific level. You're looking at the kind of revenue that you are looking to generate um, and basically kind of usually valuations at the early stage can be a multiple of revenue um, that kind of you're expected to get in that particular year. So I can I can share more details around kind of 
what that would look like. But as you saw in the first few slides, it really depends on kind of your, uh, you know, specific cap table as well as you as you move forward. But at the early stage, it's really more driven by, um, you know, what's happening in the market, your industry, and you know, your current revenue and financial position. And then Thanks. the second part, I think, was about how to raise funds. Um, she wondered if you could share funding or investment opportunities, maybe resources for those um, for them to be able to find funding or investment opportunities. Yeah, so I think um, I mentioned all, a lot of different options for funding options beyond just venture capital investments. But investors, I think that um, if you're looking at venture capital investors specifically, um, there's a lot of resources that are on the eye to eye website for who has invested in Pakistan previously. Um, something like PitchBook is also really helpful for looking at what deals have happened in the past. Um, so I think just the news and seeing kind of these kind of aggregators, which have information on prior funding is a great way to see the right kind of VC fit. And then um, the other ones I mentioned are kind of things that, you know, you have to kind of do a little bit more proactively, whether it's reaching out to the right strategic investors, talking to family and friends, crowdfunding, things like that. Thanks, Aisha. Um, moving to um, Fariha, she raised a few excellent questions. Going back to earlier in your presentation, do we have Pakistan translated or PKR equivalents of the this table? And I think she was referring to the valuation table. Also, valuation <clears throat> bands listed and then they shared and value numbers. Yeah. So I think so. I think even in Pakistan, most startups use dollar denominated valuation numbers because the investors tend to be looking at that as well. So that allows you to kind of be on the equal footing. Um, so valuation numbers are usually all like in dollar numbers um, in terms of for VC invest VC backed companies. Um, I think for the salary band ranges, I gave some indication of where things would go, but I think you would kind of have to think just equivalently in Pakistan. So for example, um, you know, like when we're looking at the tables regarding um, kind of legal and accounting expenses, that would kind of be whatever is kind of, you know, dominating the local market. Thank you. She had a follow-up question in her case, she's mm -hmm. Recycling's initiative, where she notes the uncertainty is immense, and she highlights that people's drive to use the platform still isn't the gravity of the problem, but the reward mechanism they have embedded in the business. Um, so customer retention requires continuous inflow for incentivizing. Do you have any recommendation for um, for her as she as she deals with that challenge in her business? Yeah, I think that is a really big uh, challenge. I think specifically, since she said it's a plastic recycling initiative, I think even looking at more uh, kind of holistically at things like um, environmental organizations or, you know, multilateral organizations um, can be a really great source of funding because they are used, they're, they're doing it as part of their um, kind of global mandate. Um, and I think similarly, you know, companies around the world have like CSR initiatives that are very dri driven towards things like environmental um, sustainability. So recycling often comes part of that. So even asking, you know, corporations for grants or partnering with them, um, it can be a really, really good way to kind of, you know, uh, get more funding if you are finding that limiting. So um, I think that, you know, you just have to have a very wide range of options available um, if you have that kind of a business model that's very capital intensive. Thank you. Um, Ali asked a few good questions that I think <clears throat> apply to a number of women entrepreneurs here. Um, he asked, how much should one raise over an 18 month runway and what's a good rule of thumb? Um, there, there's a few questions within one question. What are the options in Pakistan to connect with angel investors? And could you explain what safe um, debt versus convertible debt is? And what's the advantage of safe over convertible debt? And I'm happy to repeat the questions if helpful. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm also just looking at that. So I think that, yeah, um, I think 18 to 24 months of runway. Um, potentially more is a good rule of thumb. Initially, you know, pre-seed rounds tend to be between, um, you know, 
200 to a thousand dollars to about a million dollars something like that um maybe a little bit less but um if that's kind of where you can get what what you can do uh if that is an amount that allows you to build an mvp with very limited resources that should be a good rule of thumb like just to get your very base product in um obviously if you raise more money that's obviously advantageous but 18 to 24 months runway is comfortable um and obviously the more the better um and then um, Ali asked the advantage of a safe versus convertible debt. So I think with the safe, what's what's useful is that you can kind of basically raise funds uh, which are not uh, valued at a certain valuation until you raise your next round. So it gives you a little bit more flexibility to be able to um, kind of basically get get funding and you know gives you time to close your round without uh, really being uh, having an impact on your cap table immediately. With a convertible debt, it does have significant dilutive uh, power. It can be up to you know, 10% dilution or more. Um, and so you not only have to initially you know, repay, repay interest payments, but then you also have to give in your, um, give them a significant amount of equity at, at potentially later stage. I would say that you know, um, in the early stage, like pre-series B, it's definitely the safe is, is, a, is a safer option. Um, there's a lot of information on the Y Combinator website about safes and how to go about using them. Um, and then at the later growth capital option, convertible debt is something that, you know, starts to be more advantageous. But in a country like Pakistan, um, raising international debt, whether it's convertible, whether it's venture debt, is very difficult because it's very difficult to uh, kind of repatriate interest payments uh, internationally. So I would recommend to kind of uh, initially, if you're operating only in Pakistan, Kind of stay away from uh, the convertible debt part initially. Um, and then I think the other thing that Ali said, which was what are the options in Pakistan to connect to angel investors? So I think Ali is actually a great resources, resource for this because he has access to a lot of people in the Path Launch Network who are angel investors. Um, I think also um, you can look into, uh, like I would follow some of the key uh, newsletters, LinkedIn pages that are to do with startup uh, news. So like Startup Pakistan, um, Park Launch, Eye to Eye, um, Sarmaya Car, like a lot of invest, uh, you know, Indus Valley Capital and see who's raising money and which are the angel investors that have invested and would they be interested in kind of making more investments. The other thing is I think um, if you personally know people who are maybe even uh, kind of CEOs of large corporations own large family businesses. And, you know, I would reach out to them in a personal capacity and see what their interest is because a lot of people now are hearing about startups in Pakistan, seeing how successful the ecosystem is doing and they want to also make an investment. So, you know, um, it really is an open uh, kind of door, I think, for, for most people. Thank you. Um, for Maisha, I own a company which installs ACVS system. How do I get investors to fund my project since political and financial turmoil in Pakistan is making business very tough? Hmm. I'm not exactly sure what ACVS systems are, but I will try my best to help. Um, I think, you know, as as I mentioned, it's, you know, tough for any kind of um, any kind of uh, startup operating in this environment to raise money. Um, as I mentioned that, you know, if if VC, if the VC option isn't great, then, you know, there are a lot of different options. So whether it's these kind of, you know, accelerators like this grants offered by the government, so there's a lot of, uh, you know, funding available to encourage women. Um, whether it's crowdfunding, you know, um, corporate partnerships. So maybe there's an existing company that wants to grow into uh, kind of do more things associated with ACVS systems. You can often, uh, you know, you can kind of ask them for an investment in return for some equity and uh, kind of launch a partnership with them. Uh, obviously, micro microfinance is a great one, friends and family. Um, you know, angel investors. So all, all of the options that I've uh, kind of mentioned before. Thanks. Um, I'm yeah. on uh, running my website for Pakistani entrepreneurs, um, a community of women entrepreneurs of Pakistan. It has 44,000 women now making 
um, creating a marketplace for women. I think a similar suggestion, how can our request, how can we connect with investors? Um, yeah. So I think that, um, you know, it's a really, uh, I think, you know, being part of organizations like Park Launch, uh, looking at the news and seeing which investors are investing, talking, reaching out to people directly, uh, asking someone like, um, you know, Ali or like other people in the Park Launch Network to help you meet the right kind of investors is really, really important. Um, also going to events, so if Park Launch has an event, if Future Fest has an event, going to events is a great way to meet investors. Um, and also, you know, meeting with, making friends with people in existing startups who can kind of also guide you on, on what things have worked for them is really important. I think the other thing that I would mention is that um, there's a difference between um, having a start, having a startup and being like a tech enabled company that is uh, going to be the right criteria for VC investors. I think um, for, for, for more traditional entrepreneurs, I think there's honestly better luck with strategic investors rather than purely VCs who are maybe looking for the next new disruptive technology. And I think that um, that's something that people often, you know, can find a bit confusing is that, you know, why is it that a lot of these people are raising funding? Like I also have a very viable business, but really it's important to think about how your business is disrupting a traditional uh, mechanism for conducting a business. And, um, you know, what you're doing is like truly transformative in the local market. Um, that is something that VCs really, really do care about. Um, because they are going to really ask you about what kind of technology you have, your tech stack, what kind of product features you'll have. So I think having an application or web or, or some kind of technology driven portal is really, really important for any kind of, um, you know, VC investment. I think um, partially that might answer um, Shamila asked a follow up question. Um, if what, what do you do if your idea is more acceptable globally than in Pakistan? Um, so it sounds like, um, Shamila, you have a disruptive idea um, to some extent, but wondered if you have thoughts on that, Amina. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I think that it is, I think it's also worth talking to um, companies that are kind of doing this um, in, a, in, a, in an abroad uh, standpoint and you know, maybe don't have a presence in this kind of emerging market. Um, they could obviously look at acquiring, you know, an emerging company and and work with you in that way. So when you, I think you, uh, Aisha said that her business was more around like the CCTV cameras and access control. Like I'm thinking of something like Mercata, which is a really big, like IoT based like security company. Like I think looking at strategic options is also really really important on a global level. Thank you. Um, Ghoul asks, do you think it's a good idea to create a 10% employee stock option pool before Series A? And then two follow-up questions. <clears throat> How about converting the startup into a public listed company instead of going for Series A funding? Do you think at speed levels, speed level startups can scale and grow without Series A funding? Um, it's obviously hard to tell. I think given that there's a lot of uncertainty in the Pakistan market, um, that does a kind of, um, you know, it makes sense that you're thinking about that. Firstly, on the equity side, I would say that I wouldn't give an, a proper ESOP pool like early on, um, because obviously you want to incentivize like the few employees that you have. But I think usually before you reach the series A level, you may not have the employee base to be able to really allocate the um, stock options in the most efficient way. So obviously you can kind of give people equity in their, as part of their contract and kind of tell them that this is what, you know, it'll be something that they'll actually be issued after the series A round. Um, but obviously you have to see what makes sense for your business. And if there's some very early employees who are making a big impact or are, you know, very key positions like head of technology, head of, a chief CFO, head, head of risk or head of operations, something like that, then obviously they do deserve, you know, a high level of, of equity. But generally, I would say that you can allocate it, but you also don't have to issue the shares before your, your round. Um, on the public company side, I think that 
Um, it is an option definitely for companies in Pakistan. Um, I think one thing to note is that the uh, public markets here are not you know, performing in the best uh, way given the uncertainty in the macro environment. So in terms of like you, the amount of value creation that you may have, that may not be as uh, you know um, significant as what you may have by raising money, uh, you know, um, and growing your business the VC route or or the private route. Um, I would say generally, like if you're not a profitable company and you don't have like things like audited financials and a proper like corporate governance structure. Um, it, you probably wouldn't be at the right stage to be a public company that usually requires some maturation in terms of like your structure and kind of like your financial position. But it's definitely something that you can consider talking to a financial advisor with um, and, you know, see what other options are available to you. But I would say that in general, at this stage, the pre-seed level, like focus more on angel investors, strategic investors, um, you know, grants. Um, you know, uh, things like that, and and then worry about the public company option once you have like, you know, three, four years of, of operations. Great. I know we are at time, and I wonder if we could extend by five minutes. Um, Amina, do you have time to run through the last? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, being a sole founder, how can we evaluate all these finances with no previous business knowledge? And it goes to an earlier question regarding definitions for some of the key terms. Um, could you just comment on um, how those without a business knowledge can approach this um, yeah, issue? Yeah, for sure. I think, I think I mentioned it during the presentation, but I think one thing that's really important is to have the right kind of financial advisors. Um, if you have someone who can even, you know, put together your initial business model and um, you know, help you with, with the budgeting and all. If you're not a finance person, you're a solo co-founder particularly, then it will be really important for one of your first hires to be someone who has an accounting uh, background and, and has experience doing the um, kind of financing and budgeting for um, growing companies. So someone maybe from another startup in a finance role or someone from something like um, an accounting firm would be really, really important for you. And I think as a founder, a lot of it is also things that you can definitely teach yourself. Uh, financial modeling is, is not difficult. Something that there is a lot of resources out there for on YouTube. There's a lot of courses you can take. There is a lot of work you can do internally on kind of getting templates online and working with them, seeing what works for your company. And then, and then of course, talking to your mentors and talking to people who are like, for example, in the Pop Launch Group or have uh, our investors or our previous co-founders who can also give you an, a, a kind of some advice on what works and what doesn't work because just having a third party create a model for you is not going to be something that's going to you know be something you can present to investors immediately because you also need to make sure that that model is conveying in the language that the investor wants to hear thank you amina um what would be that you're Rule of thumb: If you were a growth, you were at a growth stage with a decade-long journey of bootstrapping and making it sustainable. How do VCs or angels look at such companies? Um, I don't think. I mean, it really depends on. I think what matters more is what your business model is. Um, if you are a VC, if you are looking for VC funding, you have to have a tech-enabled or a disruptive business model that is in some way. Um, changing uh, an existing way of doing things. Um, you know, it, it's using technology initially. So um, I think, you know, I don't think anyone has an issue with, with a bootstrap business, but it's really more about the business model. Um, and, you know, if it is, if it is a decade long, I think they will be a lot more focused on profitability um, and kind of, um, you know, uh, but, but I think that you, since you have a good amount of traction, there's, you probably have a lot of data, um, that you can present in a financial model or a user information, which I think may make it easier for some investors to make a decision. So, um, yeah, I think um, I think it's always best to look at a wide variety of funding options. Don't just limit yourself to VC or tech uh, entrepreneur angels. You know, like have a very wide range of type people. Um, and always, I think. When you're a business owner, whenever you leave your house, you're a representative of a business. It's not just that you go to work and you come home. So wherever you go, whether it's you're going and meeting people at a wedding, you're meeting people 
with your friends. You know, always talk to, them, talk to them about their business, about your business, about different ways in which they can help you. Um, I think that that's a good, just a really great way of informally networking with people in your existing ecosystem and, and seeing, you know, um, how could anyone potentially help you? Thank you, Amina. This was, I can't um, thank you enough for kicking off the accelerator. I think a lot of what you talked about leads us perfectly into the next few weeks. Um, you know, how to build your team, how to brand and market yourself, um, I think fits into a lot of um, the follow-on questions that people had. So thank you for this insightful presentation and hopefully we can stay in touch as we move through um, this accelerator. Um, Ali, yeah, did you? Definitely. And um, if, I think Ali created a follow-up WhatsApp group for the cohort. So um, Ali, I can definitely answer any questions that, that anyone had specifically or, you know, um, any other way I can help. Thank you. That's wonderful.